So I'm Helen Harper. I work at the University of New England. I'm a lecturer in the School of Education. So I teach um, in the initial teacher education program. I teach in the English primary curriculum area. So oh. I have a background in uh, teaching English as a second language. And also I spent some time um, doing some work in Aboriginal linguistics some years ago. I lived for many years in the Northern Territory. And then over the last 15, 20 years, I guess, I've become more interested in uh, schooling and um, particularly the schooling of marginalised students, uh, marginalised children. So they're the ones um, who go to school and don't quite get it. So that manifests in all sorts of ways. Um, low results. Um, Indigenous kids are often in that category of marginalised students. So are students who are learning English as an additional language, but so are students who have English as a first language who just kind of don't get school. I don't mm. get the reasons why they're there. So that's been um, something I've been interested in. And that's been very much sparked my, my experience in Indigenous education in the Northern Territory. That's fantastic. We'll get right into those topics. But first, you've just had published in MCA a paper which talks about Vygotsky, Halliday and Bernstein or Bernstein. Now, I know Vygotsky, but I hear these names about Bernstein and Halliday, and I really have no idea who they are or why they're connected with Vygotsky. Could you tell us a bit about those three people to start with? Okay, here we go. So we wanted to, in this paper, we wanted to bring the three perspectives together. It's not um, an original thing to do. You'll see that right early on in the paper we cite Rakaia Hassan, who wrote a paper doing just that, in, published in 2005, and she spoke about them as exotropic theories. That is, they're different theories. They have different perspectives. So Vygotsky is a psychologist. Bernstein is an educational sociologist, largely, and Halliday is a linguist. So we have those three um, areas of inquiry. Um, the exotropic theories in the sense, and um, that's, that's Rakaia Hassan's word, um, in that they, they intersect at important points um, and she calls them logically permeable. So they align, even though they're, they're talking about um, different areas. But what they all have as a sort of central point of interest is um, cultural systems. So with Vygotsky, we're looking at the notion of activity system um, Bernstein talks about discourse. Bernstein's very annoying because he uses words um, <laughs> in ways that nobody else uses them. But when he's talking about discourse, he's also talking about cultural systems. Mm. Um, and Halliday uses the term context of culture. And by that, he means discourse too. He means the mm. cultural system. Okay, so we, uh, we wanted to outline why we think these three perspectives are important. And I guess um, we wanted to show how we have applied those three perspectives to our own work, um, which is looking at um, pedagogy in these classrooms with marginalised students. Um, and we wanted to show why these theoretical perspectives are important when you look in these kinds of, well, they're, they, they're important to any kind of pedagogy, but they're particularly important in these contexts. Um, Ultimately, what we want to be able to do is a kind of translation for teachers um, to show, to be able to show teachers what tools we can bring from these theoretical perspectives and to talk about these tools in a way that is meaningful for teachers. Um, because teachers are not academics. We can bring all the theory we like, but, you know, teachers' um, daily activities are not concerned particularly with theory. So um, we want to, to uh, show how we look particularly at interactions in classrooms and how we can um, identify the theoretical perspectives and use them um, for more effective teaching. So that's what we wanted to do. So we have um, 
discussed uh, some research. So I should say my co-author in this paper is Bronwyn Parkin, who's a long time collaborator of mine and oh, yeah. someone who's also got a, a long, many, many years of experience in Indigenous education. Um, so uh, a uh, three or four years ago, we got um, a little grant from the Primary English Teaching Association of Australia to um, do this work in classrooms. We, um, we wanted to look at how teachers develop um, what we call academic language. And what we mean by that is the language that's um, appropriate to the discipline areas of the curriculum. Mm. Um, how they can develop this language um, uh, using um, scaffolding pedagogy um, in, in these uh, marg classrooms with marginalised students. So we wanted to um, work with teachers who were prepared to work with us, like to do a sequence of lessons with us, plan with us, um, and video those lessons. Um, and... Uh, and, and plan the sequence of lessons in such a way that we were very intentional about the kind of language we wanted the teacher and the students to be using so that we would be sure, as sure as we could, that the students were actually going to learn that kind of language. Mm. Um, so we worked in two places. One was a remote community in the Northern Territory. Um, and in, that, in those classrooms, we actually looked at the subject area of maths. And the other school was uh, Inner West Adelaide School, which caters for a large, mm. large cohorts of newly arrived um, students, um, most of them English as an additional language. And there we looked at the subject area of science. Right, so um, it has, we have to work with teachers who like us and want to work with us, who aren't going to feel terribly, terribly stressed by the process. Mm. Um, uh, and you trust us, basically. Mm. Um, I tend to hang out at the back and take the pictures. Um, my collaborator Bromwyn tends to <laughs> tends to butt in and say to the teacher, "No, no, say it like this a lot," um, because mm. I, I really want to see you do that. So um, mm. she's a little more interventionist than I am. But what we did was a lot of planning. So it was Sunday together, mm. um, figuring out not so much the teachers knew what they wanted to do, but because we went in with this intention of really focusing on language. Uh, we sat down on the Sunday and decided what language was going to be explicitly taught. And in, in the case of this particular sort of um, approach that we were taking, we devised, um, so we taught, for example, a year seven class, we taught lunar eclipses, or the teacher taught lunar yeah. eclipses. Um, so we devised an actual focus text um, before the teacher started teaching. And that text encapsulated the knowledge that the teacher mm. wanted the students to know about lunar eclipses by the time mm. they got to the end of the week. Mm. And that was part of a bigger, what we call a unit of work of, um, you know, about the universe and the galaxy and other things. But mm. in that week, they were focusing on unit lunar eclipses. Now, that focus text was not something that got given up front to the students. That focus text, we did a lot of work on it, on getting it right mm. and knowing mm. what was in it and knowing what the language was doing in it. But the focus text was something in the teacher's head. He actually had it mm. on, a, on a paper beside him. Mm. So that as he built this knowledge through the various activities they did, through looking at animations, through building 3D models, through a whole lot of things, he just kept coming back and back and back to this language. Mm. One it's of the, like building in the mind. You've got yes. a plan there and you build. Be beautiful, beautiful. Mm. That's, a, that's actually a beautiful, um, I'll probably quote you on that, Andy. It's a beautiful... <laughs> um, way of talking about it. So um, a, a, a nice way and one that teachers get when we do um, professional learning with them, and this comes from Jim Martin, who's a colleague of Halliday, uh, who's a systemicist. He talks about powering up and powering down. Mm -hmm. So powering up is the language, it's the academic language, the discipline specific language, it's the language of the complex grammatical structures that you want the kids to develop. Uh, you want them to be able to say that and be able to write that. That's where you want them to go. And powering down is our everyday common sense language. So, you know, when we teach science, we tend to start with the hands-on and we tend to relate it to everyday experiences. We have this common sense language. Now, what happens in particularly in education with um, low-achieving kids in low socioeconomic 
low socioeconomic schools, in Indigenous schools, is we stay powered down. We don't, uh, we stay with the everyday common sense, we stay with what the kids bring into the classroom, because we don't really know often how to build this other language and it seems like it's not part of the language the kids bring with them from home and they don't know how to do it and we don't put the time into going there. So what we were very uh, specifically doing with these teachers was saying we want you to, as you introduce your um, video animation of the lunar eclipse, we want you to start, actually we want you to turn the sound off first. We don't want that narrative that's come from NASA or somewhere like that. We want teacher's words. And we want you to start very intentionally building this, um, this language that we've decided we're going to use. Um, now you can't just power straight up because then it all gets too abstract and too hard. You've got to power down again. Um, Jim Martin uses the term semantic wave. It goes up and down and up and down. Yeah. Your lessons should have a semantic wave. So um, you explain, so a lunar eclipse occurs when the sun, the earth and the moon are in direct alignment. That was the words we wanted. Yeah. So you look at the picture, well, you can see they're all in a row or they're all in a line. You could draw a line through there. So you explain yeah. like that. Now, when scientists talk, um, they want to sound authoritative. So let's use, let's say it like this. Let's say they are in direct alignment. Can everybody say that together? So this is the notion, I think it's a Vygotskyan notion of, um, uh, I think uh, Wersch uses it, of uh, ventriloquation. So we actually want to mouth this. We want to hear it coming out of the mouths. Everybody say that together. It doesn't matter they're year seven. Mm. Everybody say we want to hear direct alignment. Mm. So the next day when we come back, so we come back to the same material the next day, we do this again, and we say, okay, so... Um, What's happening here with the sun, the earth, and the moon? The kid puts his hand up and says, they're in a line. Yeah, and can anyone remember what was the term we used yesterday? Direct alignment. Okay, so you develop this orally. Mm. It's oral, but at the same time, and this is a kind of, it was one of those discoveries. I'm <laughs> ashamed to say it was a discovery because it actually was this profound thing we did, um, which we hadn't been doing, was as we developed this language orally, um, we developed also these class notes where we started to write this language up. But we, uh, what we had been doing prior to thinking about it hard enough was we'd been writing the notes in a kind of haphazard way. And we realised that if we visually organised the notes so they represented the text which the students were eventually going to write, which was actually the text that was already in the yeah. teacher's head, Mm. then that was going to be a much more powerful tool to mediate the writing task mm. that we were coming to. As, so as it goes on, there's this oral work, there's this develop, and you're building these concepts and you're building this text on notes. Then you're mm. going to go to a, a class negotiated construction of that text, mm. which the kids can already say. Mm. Um, and at that point, um, so one of the tenets of this particular approach is that um, we don't divide the kids up into ability groups. Mm. Um, the ZPD is a class ZPD. Mm. So um, in Australia, mm, ZPD is understood in many different ways, but often it's interpreted as mm. um, we've got to make the level of teaching uh, appropriate to the different kids' levels. So mm. what we do is we divide kids up into ability groups and then you're the low achieving kids, you can do that lower level task. And you're the high achieving kids, you can do that high level task. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we don't do that um, because we don't want those lower achieving kids in a lower achieving task. We want them on the same task. Mm -hmm. um, so up till now, it's all uh, the whole class building. Um, we talk about shared knowledge or common knowledge. We want everybody to share this knowledge mm -hmm. together. When we get to the writing task, that's where we can start to differentiate. And mm. some of those students, the ones with low English, for example, will need to come and write that task as a collaboration with the teacher when they do their own writing. Mm. Some other students will go off and write something, actually write something much more longer and more highly developed because mm. they've done a bit of extra research. But they have that core text in what they're saying, but mm. they can go off and really extend at that point, but not mm. at the beginning of the teaching sequence. Now, in the course of that, you ref we talked about it as a kind of a building metaphor. Mm. Now, 
I know that you use the the um, scaffolding met metaphor, yes. and you would be aware that among people that are uh, into Vygotsky, this is a controversial issue. People yeah. are being accused of overusing or misusing this metaphor. So could you explain to us yes. how you use the metaphor of scaffolding? Yes. So we don't, object, I mean, yeah, we don't object to it. I think people don't like it because they think it's, it's a rigid metaphor. It's, it's something that suggests something which doesn't move, maybe something like that. But we see the, it's a process, first of all scaffolding and it's a, it's a dynamic process so this is actually quite well written up in the Australian literature in particular and we can look at scaffolding at two levels we often talk about the macro level and the micro level the macro level also can be referred to as designed in scaffolding that is your um, it's like your teaching sequence so when I, when I, what I've been explaining to you right now is mm. we start here, we start in this oral way, um, we're going, we know where we're going. We've got a, mm. a very uh, clear idea of where we're going. And we have set the level of the task high for everybody. That mm. is the scaffolding at the micro level. That teaching sequence then that we follow, um, it's not that it's inflexible, it's just that you can't put carts before horses. You can't say, do your writing task and write all about lunar eclipses when the kids have not got the, the cultural linguistic tools to do that. Mm. So you have to build that first. So that's, that's the scaffolding at the macro level. Mm. The scaffolding then at the micro level is really interesting. The scaffolding at the micro level is the moment-to-moment -moment decisions you make as a teacher about and we call it also contingent scaffolding mm. uh, these contingent they're contingent on what happens with the student so you're in a relationship between teacher student and curriculum or teacher student and learning goal um, so when the when the teacher says so we can see the sun the earth and the moon uh, what can you see in this picture for example we talked about this yesterday now, there's a number of responses that could come. If you set it up properly, you're going to get a good response. You're not going to get a response that's out of left field because you've already set that up the day before. That's, um, but the, the, so the student says, yes, uh, they're, they're in a line. So uh, what you actually want that student to say is they're in direct alignment. So how do you do that? Do you say, oh, yeah, but, yeah, um, I'm looking for a different word, and then the student knows they're wrong. You don't do that. You say, yes, and we talked about that yesterday. Can anyone remember the words we used? We said them together. Mm -hmm. um, that's also, that's a contingent scaffold to bring them where you want them to be. Mm -hmm. um, and that's based on the, the, the child's response. And it's supportive. It's, it's, it's um, the affect of it has to be positive. So mm -hmm. you're never saying to children, oh, yeah, that's not the answer I want, really. You're always, wherever you can, and it's very hard to do, you're always building this kind of positive effect with it. Now, it's dynamic in the sense that at the beginning of a teaching sequence, uh, the teacher is the knowledgeable other in the equation. So mm. it's going to be more teacher directed. Um, and what you're aiming for is what we call handover. Um, so uh, can anyone remember what we called that? Yeah, direct alignment. Now on day three or day four, it's um, in, at, 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 in day one, it's been, I'd like you to look at this picture, or I'd like you to look at this diagram or this animation, and I'm explaining to you what I can see in it. That's very teach directed. On day four, mm. it's what can you see in this diagram? Tell me, tell me. It's open-ended. Mm. Um, so, and then you're looking for handover. Can they tell me? If they can't, that's okay. You can always recuperate again with your contingency. Mm. Um, but if they, but what, but what you want is to hear them now on day four, just telling you. I noticed that teaching them the language, like with the Latinisms, saying mm. in alignment mm. rather than in mm -hmm. a line, yes. uh, seems it's not sufficient for them to say they're in a line. They have to learn to use the Latin word. Yes. So this is where Halliday is important. Mm. Yeah, Halliday is, uh, is, is mm. a, a, very, um, a very strong theory, a very strong linguistic theory for this kind of work because Halliday's theory um, 
is very much about this notion of continuum between um, the everyday common sense, uh, the here and now, the less formal. Um, and so, so language, language is a system of choices. We have these choices in language. We have choices in um, uh, how we talk about content. We have choices in how we make our um, uh, interpersonal work. And we have choices in whether we're more um, spoken or whether we're more written. So if you're familiar with Halliday and theory, that's referred to as field tenor. So field is the, the what, tenor is the interpersonal, and mode is the whether it's more spoken-like or more written-like. So there's this continuum of choices on each of those three systems of meaning, right? Tell me, what is the Australian education system doing wrong in, <laughs> in so far as uh, the students who are marginalised? Okay, so um, um, so I've already mentioned one thing I think we're doing wrong which is that we often assume that um, lower achieving kids need uh, lower level tasks. Mm -hmm. Now, if you haven't got uh, a good understanding of scaffolding, as I've explained it, um, and if you, you haven't got those kind of pedagogic skills, then it's actually very difficult to, to keep everybody um, in the same task in your classroom. So that, those Vygotskyan ideas are really, really important. They're absolutely essential. Um, the, Halliday, the Hallidayan idea of language is also very important because that helps us understand where we want to go with the language that we're teaching. Now, you might say not all teaching is about language, but in the Hallidayan philosophy, um, the language not only represents the knowledge, it also is the knowledge. So we can't really be a scientist unless we can talk like mm. a scientist. Yeah. yeah. So that's mm. that idea. So the Hallidayan um, theory tells us what language we need to teach because it tells us about that continuum and, and where we want to go between the everyday common sense into the, the academic and discipline specific. Mm. Um, one of the other things, things we get caught up with in Australia and to some extent in other countries too is um, the dichotomy between or what's seen as a dichotomy between um, teacher-centred learning and, and student-centred learning. Now that's seen as a sort of an either or in, in many people's minds. So um, when we think of teacher-centred learning, we think of kind of old-fashioned sage on the stage, chalk and talk, you know, we have all these terms for it, um, not very interesting, not engaging for students. And we often blame poor education results on these kind of very outdated, what's perceived to be outdated modes of teaching. Nobody wants to be like that, you know, mm. boring old teacher. What, what we think we want to be is more student-centred. So we want learning to be discovered by students. We want it to be exciting. We want lots of exploration. Um, we want students to feel in charge of their own learning, to be empowered by their own learning, right? Now, it's, it's really a false dichotomy. I mean, and if you think of, you know, I've been talking about the relationship between teacher-student curriculum, um, and I think, if I understand properly, the Russian word abushini teaching is, is teaching and learning, isn't it? It's one thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, it's in, in, in English, we tie ourselves up in, up in knots because we haven't got a word for it as one thing. We have to talk about teaching and learning, teaching and learning all the time. Um, but this, this notion of scaffolding that I've been describing is actually... Uh, it's neither teacher-centred nor student-centred. It's, mm. it, it's dynamic. It's both. And it, it changes according to the need. Mm. So, um, so, so the dichotomy is a false one. Now, what, what Bernstein did was he said, look, there's actually, it's not even, it's not even a two-way dichotomy. He's drawn a diagram where we can see these four quadrants. And so there is an x-axis and a y-axis. And um, if you look at the diagram, what that, that creates then is these four sections. Now, the top half of the, of the four quadrants, the, the top two, the top right and the top left, represent what I've just described. 
They represent um, on the right hand side what we call traditional style pedagogies, which are teacher centered stage on the stage, sage on the stage type things. Um, and the left hand side represents what we often call progressivist pedagogies, which is student centered. Um, and in, in both in both of those uh, top quadrants, we are seeing um, learning, we're seeing learning as an individual effort. So we're seeing that the child is kind of responsible for their own learning. So we're seeing um, if the teacher lectures the child and the child doesn't learn, that somehow the onus is on the child. I taught you, you didn't learn. But at the same time, when we go into the progressivist area, the progressivist quadrant, if I set up a lovely set of things for you to discover, I facilitate that. And uh, you don't discover anything as a child. I set up a little kind of, you know, we set up a scientific experiment. We make volcanoes out of you know, bicarb soda and it's exciting and fun. And we're supposed to learn something out of that. But I don't tell you what it is you're supposed to learn. Then you're no better off. <laughs> And what happens is that the middle class kids know what they're supposed to learn because they know what the game is. Mm -hmm. And the marginalised kids come out going, I don't know what that was about. We had fun making the volcanoes, but I don't know anything about mm -hmm. science from it. Mm -hmm. So the issue with progressivist education, what we also often call learning, uh, learner-centred education, is the curriculum is invisible. Mm -hmm. And that disadvantages um, Indigenous and other kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, one of the issues in Australian education is we're all progressivists. Um, when, you, when you present this diagram to teachers, they, they often get a bit defensive about it because they see themselves in that top left-hand mm. quadrant. You say, you know, it's problematic if you're setting kids up to fail all the time. Mm. So if we look at in our, on our, in our four quadrants, at the bottom two squares, the bottom two quadrants, mm. These are, this is the continuum from seeing learning as an individual effort to seeing learning as a collective enterprise. Mm. So we see learning as more of a collective thing in mm. these bottom two sections. Um, so now the teacher is also responsible for the learning. It's not all on the child and the class, mm. the whole group is responsible for learning. Mm. And we see um, on the left-hand side, we have uh, what, what um, we call critical pedagogies. And these are your, your um, pedagogies where you, um, Paolo Freire is this kind of, mm. uh, sits there. It's mm. where you bring in community. It's where you say we design curriculum from community. In the Aboriginal context, it could be where we bring in the elders into the school and we co-develop curriculum mm. with them. Um, and these are very important interventions because they give people mm. control of knowledge, um, they give people control of what goes on in the school, mm. et cetera, et cetera. However, mm. they don't necessarily... <laughs> so you, there's not necessarily a mechanism when you're sitting in that quadrant mm. for accessing the mainstream curriculum. Mm. And if we see the goal, and this is the discussion that's, you know, a bit open-ended, mm. but I think Bronwyn and I... Um, see the role of schooling as being to empower future adults to mm. gain uh, participatory citizenship. Mm. If you see that as a role of schooling, then you have to be able to access the mainstream curriculum. Mm. If you are designing curriculum based on Aboriginal knowledge systems, for example, that is important, but it doesn't necessarily give you access mm. and there isn't a mechanism to get there. Mm. So we need some other mechanisms as mm. well. Mm. And this in our bottom right quadrant is what we call the subversive quadrant. Mm. And this is where we sit with Vygotsky. Mm. So it may be teacher directed, but the curriculum is visible. We make it really explicit. So when I talked mm. earlier about our focus text, that focus text is, is the language we're going to use to represent the learning that we want to do and the knowledge that we want mm. to share. That is making things explicit. And then we have uh, that obviously the Hallidayan um, uh, perspective on language gives us uh, an understanding of how to analyse that language. Um, and we have our scaffolding. Could here. you <clears throat> tell me about your experiences when you said you were working with Aboriginal languages and we'll move on from there. You can just move on yourself, if you like, in what you say to the issue of teaching 
Aboriginal Aboriginal kids in school where it's far from being their first language. Mm. Start with your experience with Aboriginal languages. Okay. Um, well, I first went to Cape York, actually, in the far north of Cape York, um, as a very great green, green, very naive doctoral mm. student um, with no idea of what I was doing, really. And I wrote a PhD thesis about really why people had stopped transmitting their first language to their children, mm. which took place uh, in the earlier decades of the 20th century. So when I was there, there were still older people there who knew language, um, who didn't really speak it, but who, who certainly heard it and understood it mm. and could tell me language. Um, uh, but yeah, the younger generation were all speaking a, a Creole language. So that was my first interaction with um, Indigenous languages as a, I don't know, a rather old fashioned sort of ethnographic linguist, um, a little bit out of my depth, um, but an interesting exploration into really what I, what I came to realise is other people's business, you know, other people's history, um, which I hope I managed to write in a, in a, in a respectful way. Um, but I then got a job in the Northern Territory at um, what was then called Bachelor College, and they ran a uh, a course for um, Aboriginal people from bilingual schools, the then bilingual schools, who um, wanted training, elementary training in linguistics. And so I taught that for a number of years. And in the course of that, in, during that job, I travelled to lots of communities and I met people, lots of different language speakers, and I got to know the bilingual schools quite well. And I got to know kind of how that all worked. And I guess... Um, I guess I had a level of dissatisfaction with what we were achieving in that process because I could see that um, the language pedagogy was not moving beyond a certain level. Now, we can have all sorts of arguments as to why that is, um, but um, the Indigenous language teaching was... Uh, um, had all sorts of issues with funding and organisation, but the English language teaching was in a really sorry state because um, it also wasn't taking kids far enough with the result that you had really kind of low literacy levels, it, irrespective of whether they were bilingual schools or non-bilingual schools in the territory, and there were both, there were low literacy levels in English. I guess that's when I became interested in these notions of pedagogy and how we get there. Um, personally... I'm not sure. I, I have to say, um, I think bilingual education is is a goal. It's 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 the ultimate goal. It's what's preferable, but it's not always feasible. It's not always feasible because you haven't always got adults who can teach. You've often got schools where there are multiple languages. So which one do you teach? Um, uh, and it's yeah, and it's it's an ongoing effort to keep to keep organising. But I feel there's no excuse for bad English teaching because the majority of the teachers are English speakers. That's always something that's irked me a lot. It's quite possible to um, have kids come into school with no English and to with um, respect and with um, you know a strong effort to understand where the kids are coming from and a strong effort to connect with the kids and create your positive relationships. It's quite possible to teach English and teach English literacy, literacy from a very long, young age if your pedagogy is sound mm. and if you are respecting where the kids are at. Could you tell me, uh, Ellen, is there a, a difference between like where you were in Adelaide with a, mm. an immigrant multi-language, multicultural community and the situation in northern Queensland uh, where you have Indigenous children. What's the, the differences in, in teaching there? I'll, I'll talk about the territory rather than North Queensland because the territory is really sure. where I've worked with schools more. Um, so the difference, yeah, I think the difference is relatively easy to, cate to, categorize, to characterise, hmm. but most of the immigrant kids come with a sense of why they're at school and why they want to be with school, that they hmm. see that as an empowering thing. Hmm. Um, and as do their parents. So they're cued into the motivations of schooling, not necessarily without the teachers doing a lot of work on making that explicit. 
um, it's not necessarily a, um, a given. Mm. But um, that's something that comes more easily in that context because people have come there for a reason. In the Northern Territory, the process of colonisation is, is unfinished business, you know, and, and people in the bush never signed up to be colonised. They never signed up for it. So there's a huge ambivalence about schooling, which, you know, is evident in really low attendance rates and really low success rates in schooling. How do you tackle that? Hmm. I... Um, <laughs> in Bronwyn and Mai's project has, has been to work with teachers in classrooms. So the tackling of um, the, the big picture tackling, which is about attendance and getting people to sign up for the project of schooling and other things like, you know, making sure that kids have food in their belly and making sure they haven't got, you know, they can hear setting up the classroom so that mm. it's, you know, it's not too much background noise and all of those issues are issues that most people want to tackle when they talk about Indigenous education. Mm. And they're the things, um, to some extent, we've, mm, I don't know, they're ongoing issues. I guess what Bronwyn and I have said is everybody wants to tackle those issues. We've got all sorts of solutions for them. But no one's looking at what's actually happening in the classroom for the kids who do turn up and come in there. Mm. We're making all sorts of assumptions that um, teaching just happens. And like, the kind for example... In terms of assumptions, for example? In terms of assumptions. Um, so uh, when we talk about, you know, the, from a got skin perspective, again, when we talk about you know, schooling being culturally embedded, it's, 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 it's an activity that's culturally embedded, um, we assume that people know why they're there. Um, and so we make a, so from that assumption, we assume that kids know to come in and sit down. We know that when we put a picture on the board that they would look at the board, you think, you put a picture up, you say, you start talking about it. You'd assume the kids are looking at it. Not so necessarily. <laughs> That's not necessarily obvious. Mm. Um, you know, a, a, a classic is when you hold a book up mm. and you say, um, what can you see on the cover of this book? What can you see here? So you expect the kids to describe the picture that they see. There's a lovely example a colleague of mine, Wendy Cowie, gives of a teacher doing exactly like that, holding a book up and saying, what can you see? And this kid's saying, I can see a little bird. And what the child was looking at was the little um, publishers, the puffin symbol. Wow. Yeah. What <sighs> can you see? I can see the public. I can see the little puffin. Yeah. yeah. It's not, it's the intent that the kids don't get. Yeah. And, you know, another one uh, which is um, in a, a, another publication Bronwyn and I have done is uh, The Three Billy Goats Gruff. Okay, you study it. It's a lovely little story. Good mm. little fairy tale. Good little model fairy tale. Scared me to death. <laughs> <kid>. <laughs> There's a nice little version out that we use. Not, not that scary. Yeah. Um, the troll is kind of just funny. Mm. Um, so, okay, goats. Three Billy Goats Gruff. What, what you want when you introduce that and you start to talk about it, is, is you want the recognition. This is a fairy tale. Um, there's three billy goats. Let's look, they're different sizes. That tells us something. You know, it's about the power of three, actually. Mm -hmm. The little one goes, the big one goes, the little, middle one goes, the big one goes, etc. It's about the good one, the good people, the good characters overcoming the bad. But that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. So that's what you want to talk about when you introduce that book because that's what's going to give you the, the, the cultural knowledge to understand mm. the story, the intent mm. behind the story. The kid says, me and my dad go goat shooting. Now, you can say, and if you're a progressivist in the mm. top left corner, you'll say, great, we've got conversation happening with the kids. We're getting, you know, mm. we're sharing, we're sharing what the kids bring into the classroom. But that's a useless comment. If you actually want to talk about fairy tale, it takes you nowhere. Then you have to say, mm. yes. And, and now I want to come talking back, back to talking about the fairy tale. So mm. you have to be careful when you set up these conversations um, because then the kid knows if you say, yes, and now we want to go back to talking about the fairy tale, the kid knows they've said something dumb then. Mm. Uh, so, uh, and they feel, oh, I'm not going to say anything else now because I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm wrong. 
and that other middle class kid there, they know they know how to talk about it, but I don't. Yeah. So how do you deal with it? You you set it up very carefully. This is where being mm. teacher directed at the beginning is very important. Mm. Mm. So um, in the you know in, in the in the literacy program I worked in the territory, um, uh, we you know we did a thing called a book orientation. That is the teacher thinks through very carefully before they start, and they. They're very careful in what they say. They say, look at this. So here are the three goats and let's notice there's a big one, a middle one, a little one. They tell the kids what is salient and what is going to be salient for mm. this study that we're doing. Mm. Yeah. Then you can come back the next day and get the kids to tell you. It mm. doesn't stay teacher-directed. You let go mm. of that kind of control. But at the beginning, mm. you come in very carefully. And you have to think, and this is where you've got to think through Culturally, what's important about this? Mm. And also, am I using a book that's rich enough to give me something that's interesting enough to talk about that gives mm. us knowledge that we can then use elsewhere? Mm. That's great. I guess the, the other part of the paper, so in the mm. paper we talked about the theories. Mm. Um, the second part of the paper we talked about um, how we... Uh, have looked at the teachers' um, dialogue in the classroom mm. and how we've categorised the different kinds of strategies that teachers can use in order to do this scaffolding, which mm. is actually a very complex thing. Mm. Um, it's something that you, you really have to practise and learn over time. You know, when you say, hmm, so... Um, yeah, so we're talking about the, um, the strategies mm. and how we've, we've made a sort of typology of them. And uh, the, the typology is based on, um, uh, partly based on Bernstein, mm -hmm. some of Bernstein's thinking. Um, so from a theoretical base, that's where it, it's coming from. Uh, mm. Well, it, it's Vygotsky, Bernstein and Halliday again. Mm. Um, and... How we've labelled things comes from our work with teachers and, and how teachers think of their own work, if you like. So I mentioned before this idea of powering up, powering down. Um, that is a really important scaffolding strategy. You've, you've mm. got to, you, you can't power up unless you also come back and power down mm. and then you've got to go up again. Um, mm. And teachers, teachers quite like that term. They take it on. Mm. They go, oh, I understand that. Um, mm. Yeah, there are three, three kind of, um, we call them three lenses, three ways you can mm. cut the orange. You know, you cut an orange, mm. it looks, oh, yeah. you get that view, or you can cut yes. it, you get that view, or you mm. can cut it, you get that view, right? Yeah. Um, so when you look at a classroom, when you look at successful teaching, it is incredibly complex. Mm. Um, and trying to sort of work with teachers and say, no, do that, or do, no, 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 do that. It, it, it all got, you know, it got very complicated. So... Mm. We said, okay, so let's just look at some things. Let's cut some of the complexity. So we look at it almost, we cut it three ways. The first way is what we call um, share the purpose. Just share your purpose. So what I've been talking about actually all the way through mm. is when kids are not succeeding in school, when they're dis disengaged, it's often because they just don't know what's going on and they don't know mm. what to attend to. Mm. And the teachers are making assumptions that that's obvious. It's not obvious mm. at all. Mm. So sharing the purpose can be as simple as, as saying at the beginning of the lesson, today in the lesson we are doing, blah. But it has, um, it, 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 it involves other things also that, that teachers don't off, sometimes don't do, which mm. is making sure that when you move from one activity to the next in the same lesson, mm. you actually link, you actually make explicit mm. what, why this activity is now important for the next one. Mm. So making a whole lot of stuff explicit. So we have little terms like look back, look forward. Mm. Tell them what you've done, tell them where you're going. Mm. Um, look back, look forward. Um, mark the boundary. So, you know, we do science in everyday terminology, everyday mm. thinking, bringing our mm. home language in. Um, mm. Let's now say, but we're thinking like scientists. So what, what kind of language do we have to use? And mm. how do we want to think about this? How will we do a scientific explanation? Mm. So this boundary that goes between the everyday and the academic. Um, 
focusing their attention, like I said before, what, they, what you actually want them to look at. So that's one lens, sharing your purpose. Mm. That one is, is relatively straightforward. Another lens we call sense making. Um, this is uh, <laughs> making sure that everything you do actually makes sense to the students. Mm. Um, I was in a secondary classroom in a, a boarding school in Darwin, it was a science class with Aboriginal kids from the bush. And the teacher used to put up these, he was trying to do the right thing. He would put up a PowerPoint with lots of words in it to say what the goals of the lesson were. And there were like, you know, eight goals and they were all really wordy and it would be on a PowerPoint. And these kids were like pretty disengaged. And then he would be talking about what they were doing in the lesson at the same time for quite, at quite some length. And I said to him, so <laughs> research shows that we can't actually read the PowerPoint and listen to you at the same time. So um, make sure that if you're talking, then they're actually listening to you and make sure if you want them to read that, that that's what you're asking them to do. But don't assume they're reading that when you're talking. Often, you know, I've, I mentioned before when we have diagrams, we're assuming the kids know what to look at in the diagram or the picture. Mm. But, yeah, so what we call sense-making, um, make sure that all your semiotic systems are aligning with each other and that you're, if you want them to be attentive to one semiotic mm. system that you're using, then you're making sure their attention is directed mm. to it and the words are right for it. Mm. Um, and this is where our power-up, power-down is important too, that the, the, the powered-up words are making sense and they make sense when you power down. Mm. Um, yeah and moving between con concrete and abstract. And then the last lens is what we call using classroom interactions for inclusion. And this is the whole notion of your contingent scaffolding. Mm. And this is coming back to the, the Parish of Barney. Uh, the, one of the important things that I've mentioned is that the interaction has to be positive. There's, you can't, mm. an interaction will not be uh, uh, will not um, result in something that's learnable if the affect is not positive. Mm. So mm. all of those questioning strategies where you're setting kids up to be correct, you're telling them what you want them to tell you first, mm. and then you're um, applauding them for giving the right answer, you reconceptualise, you take it to a higher level, you come back to it, you see if they can do it again. Um, all of that... Um, with uh, younger students, oh, with, with all students, often we, we talk about the class as we. Mm. So we're all included all the time. Mm. Um, we have little strategies like that, um, which, which make the interactions positive. And I think perhaps that's where that notion of Perijvani comes in, but I'm not sure if I understand it. Mm. These are, these are this is a sort of typology we've developed and, and, and that's mm. in the paper. Um, mm. of um, uh, so to help teachers think about what they do and and bring it to their consciousness often they're already doing it mm. Mm. Um, but bringing it to their consciousness helps them to, uh, to do it, it better and control it and develop mm. control over it yes mm. 